so just a, a quick little overview on my history um, and how Tammy and I came to found Stronghold. And I'll keep it brief so that we can get into all of the great questions that everyone submitted shortly. Um, but it was 2011 when I came across Bitcoin for the first time. Um, it was because I saw it being used as a donation mechanism for uh, WikiLeaks, I believe at the time, right? Because Visa and MasterCard had shut down the payment mechanism for them. And I thought, you know, this is super interesting. It's like a programmable currency, um, but it was an alternative currency. So I played around with it a little, but I didn't think an awful lot of it at the time in terms of something that I wanted to pursue personally. End of 2013, start of 2014 is when Ripple open sourced, right? They finally launched their Ledger product open source and people started using it. Um, and about six months after that, Stellar started. So Jeb McCaleb started Stellar. And Tammy was actually their first head of growth. And now what we had with these distributed Ledger technologies was traditional currencies on top of ledger technology. So it had all the things that Bitcoin had in terms of its blockchain tech, but it was currencies that everyone knew how to use already. And that was super exciting because, you know, growing up, one of the biggest problems I saw was the problem of remittance, right? My mother would send money back to the Philippines. Uh, the fees were really high for what were, you know, relatively small amounts of money. And that seemed super unfair. Um, so I started working with Tammy at Stellar. And I partnered with Ripple and Stellar, and we started building essentially remittance products. Um, that was really early on, right? That was pretty early in the crypto space, and there were a lot of issues and teething problems. Um, so it was really a few years later, 2017, when a lot of investment money started moving into the space that Tammy and I decided, hey, let's have a go at this ourselves. Let's build on top of these technologies. Um, let's get you know investment money in the door and see what we can do. And that's really what kicked off Stronghold. So the big thing that we're interested in is providing financial access for all. Um, it came from our passion in really remittance money transfer internationally. Um, but over time, we've realized that there are problems, you know, much closer to where home is for both of us, which is in the US. Um, so, you know, we, we do serve the domestic US market a lot now as well. Um, but similar problems, just different audience. That's a funny question. Um, I hope it's not controversial. I like both. I grew up with cats uh, on a farm, farm cats, hunting the, the mice and such. Um, but I'm a dog person now. I kind of transformed. So I brought my dog over from New Zealand to the US when I moved. So he flew over with me. Um, I have a German Shepherd. He's almost two years old, I think. So definitely a dog person now. This is a, a great question, and I bet a lot of people on the Stronghold team have actually never heard where the name comes from either. So originally when Tammy and I were kicking things off, um, I, and I don't know exactly where she got the name from, but our project name was called Citadel. And some of you may be aware that Citadel is actually the name of a huge multinational hedge fund in the US. So clearly we could not use that. That would be, you know, a huge copyright issue. Um, so I guess it was a synonym that was found to uh, to match the logo, and that that's where Stronghold came from. So, yeah, we uh, had a little misnaming adventure there. This is really a question for, you know, to answer in depth, it would be great to have our dedicated DevOps person here uh, and our compliance team to talk about, you know, the, the nitty-gritty on what they've done. But we have done a lot of work in the last, it'll be 18 months because I think uh, in the last six months or so, maybe it's a year ago, we got our SOC 2 audit completed. And that's a, a really important audit for us to be able to work with the partners that we have that demand a certain level of, you know, security audit to have gone through to be able to work with us and integrate into our products. Um, so during that process, we, you know, had to tighten up uh, a lot of our policies and procedures and uh, both from a technical as well as a sort of compliance policy point of view. So that work really, you know, got us up to, to scratch and, and thankfully we did pass that audit with no findings um, and that allowed us to, you know, continue on the work with our partners. So um, that's what we did for that there. Yes, we are always interested in listing on more exchanges. Um, we do have some particular exchanges that we would like to work with and we've started making tracks with them. 
I think that's something I would say, though, is that we're always mindful of liquidity, right? We don't want to be spreading the trading activity too thinly over the exchanges, right? I think we've, there's sort of five main ones out there um, that we keep an eye on. Um, so we don't want to be on too many, but yes, understanding that certain exchanges are going to be more valuable for us. Um, and if we ever need the community's help and, you know, tweeting them or voting or anything like that, we'll definitely reach out. Um, but it's always something we've got at top of mind. Um, and we'll, we'll let you know if you can help. Yeah, great question. I think that one of the things that both Tammy and I learned really early, you know, even back in 2014, when hardly anyone in the crypto space was really worried about the regulatory environment was to make sure that we're building with the regulatory environment in mind from day one. And that's why from quite early on, we've always had a compliance department, head of legal, head of compliance, um, to make sure that we're doing things. And I, I think, and it, it, you may see it in how we, in how we build and what we do, a, a little bit more of a conservative manner has always been our approach to things. Um, but in terms of, you know, how we deal with regulations today, um, our audits are a big part of it. So again, SOC 2 on the sort of more technology and security side, NACHA audit for our involvement in the ACH system in the domestic US market. Um, and then it goes to the partnerships we have with our banking partners, or sometimes we have banking sponsorships to run our payments products. And as part of that, we have to have a very in-depth uh, due diligence process. So a lot of our customers, due to the nature of the businesses they are, we have to run what's called enhanced due diligence on them. Um, so there's, you know, KYB, KYC, know your business. Um, we have to run sanctions checks, background checks on them and hand data over to, to banks so they can also tick off on, on customers that are onboarding. So there's a, there's a whole heap of policies uh, and procedures that were built over time to be able to bring on those, those merchants. And we, we do that in partnership with the banks that we work with. This is one that I'm, uh, I, I'm particularly proud of right now, given the crypto winter that's going on. I just mentioned in, in one of those previous answers that we, we tend to take more of a conservative approach to how we run things, right? And our focus is always going to be on a sustainable business model, right? We are a business first before any other descriptors like being in the crypto space or whatever, right? It's important for us to make sure that no matter what happens with markets or fads, we have a sustainable business at the core of things. And I think this is why that sometimes people might think we're, we're moving a little bit more slowly than other players in the crypto space who are, you know, going fast but they're also disappearing right you see every time we have one of these crypto winters and stronghold has survived too as well as COVID now um they, they disappear they evaporate or they turn out to be a scam or you know for whatever reason they're gone stronghold is still around that's the differentiator we run our business differently to most of those in the crypto space So I was very skeptical of DeFi when I first saw it, but I have absolutely changed my opinion on it. I think that De DeFi is here to stay long term, but I also think that the traditional institutions are also here to stay long term as well. I think what it comes down to is the use case for what you're looking at, right? So some use cases are naturally going to fit the decentralized space and others you know, and a lot of the ones we deal with are, are still going to want the perceived security or real security of being able to interact with the traditional, you know, banking sector and payment systems. Um, so it very much depends on who you're working with. One of the interesting things I think that we do is we have our foot on both sides, right? Our customers, they don't, a lot of them aren't in a place to understand or learn crypto and particularly DeFi but they can still value a lot from it. So what we do is we sort of have one foot on the DeFi side, and we might get into this a little bit more on our merchant cash advances, but we can take a value from DeFi and crypto, present it to our you know traditional thinking business customers in a way that doesn't scare them, they don't have to learn new terms, uh, and give them the value. 
So that's very much one of our focuses, right? Taking the value from all this new tech and delivering it to our traditional customers. Um, so I think that DeFi will be around, you know, there'll be a lot of people who will use it directly, but I think there's going to be a lot of cases where you're sort of wrapping the technology in something that looks a bit more traditional. Um, and I don't see it replacing sort of government backed, um, fully regulated systems anytime soon. Hmm, good question. So Stronghold itself, we don't have, we, we are not a, a sort of a separate protocol or a separate network. So no, we're not a DLT in it of ourselves. However, we do integrate with multiple DLTs. And so our product, our core product, Stronghold Net, has for many years had support for multiple DLTs. Um, I, the, the, the main ones being Stellar and Ripple, right? We have both historical partnerships with both of those companies as well as customers that have asked us to build on top of them. Um, and we also do have an internal ledger technology, which we call Stronghold's Virtual Ledger. Um, and we run that when we don't need external connectivity, but the customer still wants something that looks and feels a bit like a DLT. Um, and absolutely agree that ISO 2022 uh, and Fed now and all those services and making sure those can be integrated alongside DLTs is super important. I think that ISO 2022, in particular, the richer data that's attached to transfers um, will be a key determinant in businesses' choice of DLTs in the future. So it's great to see that Ripple and Stellar have actually both thought of that and making sure that their tooling allows for uh, integrations with other products that need to, you know, talk the ISO 2022 standard. If by launchpad you mean like other ledgers or protocols, potentially. So the main thing that we're always thinking about is what value do our customers need and where are they asking for it to live, right? And right now, Stella made perfect sense to uh, launch SHX because, again, of our, our history there and, and having a lot of customers near that particular ledger. Um, but because we did need some, you know, smart contract capabilities uh, to launch some, some other things like the DeFi piece, uh, we also went on to Ethereum. If there's another good reason that we should look to launch something somewhere else, we will. Um, but right now, we're happy on those two protocols. Yeah, and I guess we sort of touched on this before with the way that, you know, we've oriented the business and that's always having that sustainable business model that is as much as possible, not directly linked to, you know, movements in, in the crypto market as a whole. Um, we're very interested in the technology and the value the technology brings. Um, so that's our main focus. And, you know, that doesn't change so much even during something like a crypto winter. However, I would say that the interest that, you know, market activity brings to the rest of the ecosystem is important. So, you know, we hope that the ecosystem continues to grow. So we hope that, you know, other players out there are also building sustainably as well. Oh, I'm, I'm glad that we did delay the AMA because actually one of the things that we agreed on internally was to make sure that governance made the roadmap for the year. So, and I think I answered this on the teaser the other day, governance will be on our refreshed roadmap um, for the rest of the year. There's a few priorities getting switched around, so I don't know exactly what the timeline is going to look like because we're getting product and engine involved, which you know, kind of hints to how, how soon we're looking to be building towards it. But I can confirm that we are going to have our first governance vote for SHX holders in Q4 of this year. So we're finally, finally confirming that. So super excited to see how that plays out. In terms of the wallet holders goal, it, it is hard to measure exactly how many asset holders there are. Um, we can only really look at the Stellar network is sort of a proxy um, because we can we can only just look at like how many tr trust lines are there there in that one particular network. We can't see how many users are, you know, on exchanges, um, which we expect to be quite a few. But you know, even giving a generous estimate there, we did miss the one million wallet goal. Um, and 
one of the things that we're committing to doing this year uh, in order to be able to, you know, get more wallet holders, and it really goes to retail, is our promotions feature. Um, and I'm pretty sure there's some questions coming up that we'll uh, ask, we can get into a little bit more on there. Um, but we are we are doing some work that will hopefully uh, move towards getting us closer to that goal. Maybe by the end of the year, um, we'll see. No, we will not leave the US. You know, that's this is our focus area, and all of the merchants that we've onboarded since COVID are actually in the US. It's been our it's been our big focus because you know that's where. That's where we've found revenue. That's where we've found transaction volume. So it makes sense to continue serving that. Certainly, you know, we have to keep our eye on the evolving regulatory space. Um, and it, you know, it makes certain things more difficult. But on the flip side, it makes other things easier. Because as the regulations get clearer and as we see enforcement, it actually de-risks doing certain things because our partners, particularly larger corporates and banks, actually get a bit of certainty when they see those things happening because it gives you the guide rails to work with. So it's a bit of a mixed bag. Um, lack of certainty or the inability in the US to like go and talk to a regulator is one of the reasons why we launched subsidiaries in New Zealand. And some of you may be aware of that. So for certain projects in the past, um, you know, we've wanted to go and, you know, talk to a politician to ask them questions or talk to a markets regulator. In the US, you can, you know, sign up with a lobbying group and go that way. In New Zealand, you can, you know, make some calls and next week you can literally go walk in and, and talk to someone. And we did that back in 2018. Tammy came to New Zealand and we, we talked to some politicians and we went to the uh, Financial Markets Authority in, in New Zealand to have a chat about some of the things we wanted to do. Um, and that gave us a lot more certainty and, and made us feel a lot better about launching some things out of that jurisdiction. And so one good example of when we used that was actually for the IBM partnership. Um, the financial services for that deal were actually provided out of our New Zealand subsidiary. So, you know, we, we had a little bit of flexibility because of that as well. We've been in touch with Stellar Expert about this and they haven't been willing to address the issue when asked directly. Um, we are aware that they have flagged other established and trusted projects uh, like KuCoin, I believe, <laughs> uh, as a uh, as a serial minter, um, and we have asked uh, for the community to you know reach out and and say hey, uh, you know what's this about? Can we get this resolved? And I'm sure that uh, Lena can follow up afterwards with uh, contact details on on where we might want to to try and get more of the community to rally to see if we can get that addressed. Okay, so we've been working on this one pretty intensely recently, and you will see a uh, a roadmap go out on our refreshed um, stronghold net with SHX uh, slides, uh, hopefully in the in the near future. Um, but the biggest thing and top of mind for me, because it, we launched the beta of it last week, uh, is our promotions feature. So in providing payments or payment tools for our channel partners to integrate and merchants to use, um, we want them to be able to roll out, you know, like deals. Uh, you know, hey, make a purchase now, get $10, or make your first purchase, get whatever. Um, and this will be one of the closest touch points we've had to the end consumer uh, in quite some time. Uh, the exciting thing about this is where we will move to next is letting retail users... Um, interact more with promotions themselves. And we are looking at using this channel to push SHX rewards and payments uh, right to the end consumer, which, you know, is quite a big deal uh, from our perspective. And this sort of goes back to that 1 million uh, wallet piece uh, that Tammy had the goal of earlier, um, because we will be able to uh, introduce the ability for, you know, those rewards and payments to be made by any end consumer uh, interacting with uh, merchants and currently 100% of the merchants that have come on board uh, in the last year at least uh, are all members of uh, the SHX Rewards program so they will be opted in. Um, so that's one big piece. Uh, another big piece for us is the expansion of participants in our merchant financing program. 
So that's the DeFi piece that we're using to essentially, you know, have pull contributors on the DeFi side. Um, and that works very similarly to a lot of the other, you know, pooled uh, programs that you might know in, in DeFi. For our group here, there's an allow list on who can participate, and that's for regulatory reasons mainly. Um, but we can uh, get access to capital on that side and deploy it into our merchants who are looking for cash advances, right? We have merchants that are processing payments through us, uh, so it makes sense to start offering them these extra services. And there's, you know, they're not able to access these things through traditional means. Um, so we're, we've, we've had a lot of demand there and we've really been struggling to service all that demand, which is why we need to grow the DeFi program um, so that we can, you know, just scale it up. That's really what we're doing there. So a lot of work will go into that. Um, to make that a little bit more enticing to participants as well, we will be introducing a, a administrative fees, which are paid in SHX for the program, the merchant financing program. And a good example um, is going to be a loan origination fee. So, you know, if you take out a loan, uh, the merchant will have to pay a certain amount of SHX. And this is actually what the governance vote is going to be about. And I hope I can actually talk about it now, but I'm going to anyway. Um, what the vote is essentially going to be around is what proportion of the administrative fees, and in particular loan origination, gets burned and this will be the first time we have intentional burning of the token versus what proportion gets redistributed back to the pool contributors. Um, so that is actually what the vote is going to be about. So excited to see how that rolls out and also interested to see how our current participants respond to uh, those changes, which hopefully makes it more enticing for them. Um, what else is happening? Uh, Stronghold Net's getting some like data improvements. Uh, the big one there is ISO 20022. Um, we already have some compatibility for ISO 20022 in, in certain places. I mean, we had to do some um, to onboard IBM back in the day. So that's been around for a couple of years, actually. Um, but ISO 20022 is a very broad standard, right? And there's, you know, it's not like it's all or nothing. You can support just the bits you need for the payment flows you have. We're expanding our support so that more of our customers can take advantage of it. And the big thing we're interested in right now is something called revenue recognition. Uh, any accountants uh, in, the, in the audience will immediately know what that is and how painful that can be. Um, for our more sophisticated customers, we will have a big differentiator if we can help them with that particular problem. Um, so we're extending our support to be able to provide them with more data for that. Uh, and there's also uh, support for FedNow um, in advance of that becoming available more generally. Um, we don't expect it to actually launch this year fully, um, but we need to be ready to support it, you know, as soon as it launches. So we'll work on that. Uh, yeah, that's, that, I think that's a good overview of uh, some of the main points we're working on right now. So because Stronghold isn't its own protocol, there is no need to have nodes running. So no, we won't have nodes running and it's very unlikely that we would look to have our own sort of ledger running. Uh, it makes a lot more sense for us to utilize, you know, what's already out there. In terms of staking, and I've definitely seen this question uh, pop up a few times, um, we will not be able to support staking at this time. I think that the only time we could look at staking is once the governance and decentralization piece has progressed quite a bit further. Um, so I'd, I'd like to see that, you know, as governance, as, as we have that first vote and as the governance piece becomes more and more important and, you know, there's, there's more of that decoupling going on with SHX, at that time, then the community can think about it. But as Stronghold, no, we're, we're not able to provide staking. So FedNow for us, we will support FedNow. Um, so that means we'll be able to route payments over it. And that really just allows us to improve the feature set that we can offer our customers in the domestic US. 
Um, so it's really just about making sure we're integrated to it. So I, I've just spoken a little bit about um, the Merchant Cash Advance program, which is our primary DeFi offering. Um, and as I mentioned, that's that has an allow list on it. So it's permissioned for select pool contributors, mainly due to regulatory reasons there. Um, so direct participation from, if you're asking when DeFi for retail, I don't, I don't foresee that happening anytime soon. And I don't think it makes sense for that particular product. Um, however, it will involve, as I've just mentioned, uh, the token in terms of burning or redistribution. So thankfully, the issue has been resolved. What King Octopus is referring to here is that we were marked as ST, special treatment on KuCoin due to low liquidity. And this is, you know, back to one of those earlier questions why I mentioned that we don't necessarily want to launch on too many exchanges at once just because it does, you know, thin out the liquidity on a per exchange basis. Um, but thankfully, our, our the volumes did increase. Um, and the ST mark was removed, so we're back in good sanding, so to speak. It's a good question, you know, because there's a lot of other, there's tons of payment providers out there. I mean, Stripe is the big obvious one. Um, for us, our niche is working in industries that have high compliance burdens, um, and a good a sort of a, a rule of thumb is if there's some sort of like buying restriction age is a good one such as alcohol you know gaming gambling they, they have stricter regulations and often there's kyc around the purchasing and um, so for them as well as just sometimes a stigma around what those businesses do they're unable to get banked or receive extra financial services like cash advances uh, from the traditional players right and our mission is financial services for all. So they are the industries that we target. And so for us, it's, you know, it's really using the strong banking partnerships that we've built up over, you know, many years for, you know, different elements, like, you know, our, our crypto banks are separate from the ones that are able to, you know, process other types of payments. Um, we use those in combination with our, again, history of building compliance uh, sort of focused payments tech to be able to service those markets. So that's the problem we're solving. It's, it's, it's for those in that niche. Great question, because I do see a lot of talk about, you know, how is, how is Stronghold and Ripple, you know, related? Um, so I personally partnered back with Ripple back in 2014, um, and have, you know, essentially worked with them ever since. So yes, Stronghold. Uh, has worked with Ripple, and Ripple itself, Ripple Labs, is actually an investor in Stronghold. Uh, and they put that investment in, I think it was in 2020. Could could be one year either side of that, but yes, uh, they have invested with us and we've, we've spent a lot of time uh, working with them and partners in their ecosystem, right? So we had uh, Coil as a, as, a, um, as a customer uh, pre-COVID for, for that year. Um, and we also looked at ODL flows and, and, and some of the products on that side. Uh, so yes, absolutely. And we're, you know, we'll always keep in touch and, and see what they're moving towards next to see whether there's anything useful that we can work together on. Um, and I'm also a, uh, a judge on the XRP grant panel. Um, so yeah, we are, we are super close with them. We are not actively working with Flare. Um, we, you know, the, I, I saw them update us actually today in us in our joint Slack channel. Um, there's lots of interesting things that we might want to do together. And we've talked about, um, you know, potential collaborations over time, um, but we're not actively working with them. Uh, we'll keep we'll keep in touch, and you know, as we see the, you know, their the recent launch and how it makes sense to use what they provide you know, potentially to help us bridge where we've got multiple SHX issuance. Um, so we'll, you know, we'll obviously keep in touch and, and see where that goes. So our DeFi pools are permissioned and there's an allow list on them. 
to be able to join that group, essentially what we're looking for is uh, our sophisticated uh, capital contributors. So, that, and, and, and that sophisticated term has a particular meaning and that goes to, you know, the regulatory side of house, particularly, you know, of interest is, is making sure we're clear of, you know, any US centric regulations on that side. So, um, we have essentially as stronghold invited parties into that where we thought that they might be uh, good contributors. So it's not something that, uh, you know, most people are going to be able to contribute and unless you're already in the business of, of, of sort of doing that at scale. So because we aren't the protocol layer, you know, it's not our blockchain, it's it's Stellar's for our main issuance, or Ethereum for the side issuance. Um, it's really, it's not not to deflect entirely, but it's sort of up to them to make sure that their ledgers continue to be, you know, usable for use cases like strongholds. Um, and this is why it's important, in our opinion, to stick to technologies that have, you know, stood the test of time. Um, and this is why, one of the reasons we really like Stellar, they've been around for a long time, and they're really good at transaction volume for payments cheaply. Um, and that's what we're super interested in as a payments company. Ethereum, well, not so cheap to send payments, pretty bad, to be honest, even even now still. But they have great smart contract capability and that's where a lot of the sophisticated, you know, capital contributors we needed already were. So that's why we use uh, Ethereum for that use case. But for us, it's making sure that we're picking the ledger or blockchain technologies that make sense for our use cases. That's what it comes down to. Uh, no. Uh, and I'm, I'm curious where you're from, Raucous Porpus, uh, if you're uh, a local. Um, but Otago, Dunedin, the city, is where I went to medical school. And I, you know, I dropped out of that to, to do uh, crypto, I suppose. Um, but no, I am a bad New Zealander, a bad Kiwi, um, because I don't, I don't follow rugby like at all so no i never saw the highlanders but i i grew up in canterbury so wrong team anyway i was a crusaders fan when i was younger so there we go love that question oh so in 2022 what was i'm most excited about ticking off um well there are a few things that i'm obviously proud that the team has done uh, we launched the SHX Rewards program at the end of 2021, but 2022 was a big growth year for it, right? Every merchant that came on board um, signed up for that. Um, we launched Stronghold Capital, which is our $100 million um, investment fund, uh, and we did make uh, a few investments out of that, so that was super exciting to see and interested to see how that grows. Um, and our DeFi program grew a lot as well, because I think that had just hit beta in 2021, and we went into general availability 2022. Um, and that is one of our biggest growth areas. So making our customers extra happy, making us a lot of revenue. So clearly we're excited about that. Um, we did double the number of channel partners that we had onboarded, which means we have a larger merchant base to target, and that's keeping the team busy onboarding them. Um, so that's been good. Um, and even though it's the start of this year, so I'm going to cheat a little bit, I am really pleased that we've launched our promotions feature into beta in the last few days because that carries a lot of like groundwork for launching a lot of other things that I'm excited about, and that sort of ties into that governance vote, right, in terms of getting um, DeFi on one side and SHX rewards down to the end consumers, the customers. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that's pretty exciting.